Well, good morning and, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to talk about food packaging and it's something that I work a lot with and um, it's, it's really easy to start out with this just by saying it's all my fault. Um, every time I tell people I work with this industry, I hear that packages don't open, packages don't close, packages leak, packages burst open and spill things, packages are impossible to figure out, they create litter, they use resources, and that they're generally a waste. And it's true, and it's all my fault. So once you take the spears away, it gets to be a lot of fun. But here's the real question, how are you going to keep anything that you've got uh, without any of it? So are you going to go to the store and get a pocket full of ketchup? You know, back it up and, and fill your trunk full of tuna. There's some there's some coastal cities where you might get away with that one. Um, you're going to keep your milk in a tank in the basement. Now, if you happen to live in Ireland, um, there's some hope for you because Guinness will tanker you in some some of their lovely brew. But um, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> back to singing. Okay, we'll, we'll leave that alone. But I think you can see my point. Without without uh, specialized container systems, there's not just not a lot you can do. And so what I'm going to do is, is in, in my usual academic mode of boring people to tears, have you all sleeping in the aisles probably about eight minutes here like my students, but talk a little bit about how this has kind of changed our lives. If you went to a food store uh, in the late 19th century, most of what you would see there was locally produced and a lot of people wouldn't shop there for that very reason because they knew the people running the place and, then, and they knew that uh, there was a lot of funny business going on. Uh, P.T. Barnum started in the retail grocery industry and he wrote a lot of pithy comments about this, about the adulteration of products and how uh, you know milk would have chalk in it and, and coffee was all kinds of stuff and flour had sawdust and all the rest of it. So you really didn't know what you were getting. Uh, the products weren't regulated. Uh, there was no standard of weights or measures other than what you saw on the scale and the joke about somebody with their thumb on the scale is a very real one. No real quality assurance, no standard of identity. Standard of identity is a provision whereby if you say that your stuff is ketchup, it has to have a certain minimum composition, orange juice, things like that, and a few arguments have happened over the years. Um, more importantly for the marketing, or for the, for the general industry, there really weren't, wasn't any part of any kind of media-oriented campaign. The, uh, the uh, patent medicine market had it down pretty well, but, uh, food not so much, and so it really wasn't trusted by the public. Something interesting began to happen though, some, some interesting things began to converge, and one of them um, I likened to Amazon.com, except it was in 1891, and what this was was the Rural Free Delivery Service. Now I drove through Clay City, Clay something last night, that advertised itself as the Mayberry of the Midwest, and I wondered if they were really proud of that or not, but um, very cute, but maybe our RFD brought this, brings this to mind. It was basically where the mail system changed to the point where they would deliver pretty much anything at a, at a modern price. Huge industries sprung up around this. Uh, Sears is still around, sort of, uh, Montgomery Wards, JC Penney's, all of these started in the large scale mail delivery business. And this led to some big mass marketing systems. Some of the other things that happened were that uh, oatmeal started to roll, literally. Who the heck cares about oatmeal? My God, you just survived a long evening of singing your lungs out and you're thinking about, this guy's talking about oatmeal? My God, it's, it's night at home. Make him stop. But here's the important part. Ferdinand Schumacher started crank out oatmeal. That wasn't so quite so interesting, but what he started to do was to promote the heck out of it. And he did it on the basis of the food packaging, of the accountability of his, his company, and uh, on the health benefits that it would bring. And so by 1880, the New York Times, of all places, who normally looks down their nose at Ohio in general, said this, this is a food craze. It was the first one that was really taken note of. And the marketing was done through magazines and posters and, and all of these things that had been, begun to be delivered through the uh, RFD system. So you're starting to get magazines in broad distribution, starting to get media in broad distribution, you're starting to get stuff in broad distribution. And so some of the claims that they would have, one pound of Quaker oats makes as much bone and muscle as three pounds of beef. Well, for the livestock people in there, you know, they're lighting their torches and sharpening their spears. Um, food promotion, that's all it is. And for the physicists, they're going, wait, there's a mass balance problem there. Can't do that. Um, well, you, can, you can have fun with that. But what they really depended on was accountability. They had a four color folding carton, uh, and they could fill them at 20 cartons a minute, which was astounding at the time. 
Um, they had a standard of identity. It was just oats. I mean, you know, what, what can you do to oats to, to dilute it much further? Um, manu manufacturer's address and a, and a quality assurance guarantee. If you didn't like it, you could get your money back. So this was really the, fu the first fad food, and this has expanded out endlessly since then. Uh, every, every food promotion that you've ever seen is kind of wrapped around this. It increases your, your general well-being. If you eat enough soy protein, you'll live forever, be gorgeous, be svelte, or, act, or build muscle, depending on which, which publication you're reading, and on and on it goes. So this really kind of, kind of laid the groundwork for our modern food distribution system. Well, it's gotten a little out of hand, and, and this is um, something that, that's one of my favorites. Um, if you eat enough Cocoa Krispies, you're immune to disease. Now, for a bunch of public health professionals, eh, maybe not. And we'll get back to this here in a bit. Okay. So to continue on with, with, with general food stuff going on, in the 1920s we had grocery stores. Uh, I remember A&P in their waning years as a kid. And A&P, but they had the, the neat step of actually vertically integrating this. They had farms, at least under contract, processing and packaging operations, distribution, retail, all the way through. Post-World War II, um, a lot of suburban development, and all of a sudden you had, no longer had the, pep, the, the possibility of being able to just run down to the co corner store and buy stuff. You had to actually store food at home. You had to do it in something. You couldn't just run down to the grocery store every day because you had to drive out. All of this was dependent on, on uh, stay-at-home labor force, poor, Bar poor Barbara Billingsley having to carry it all herself. But I think you can see how this was done. Here's the problem with this, though. You've got a, a distribution system in place, and it's entirely dependent on one person w working and one person staying home. Guess how long that lasted? Not very long. Um, now we've got multiple, you know, families are anything you want them to be, um, and so we're absolutely dependent on packaged foods and packaged everything else, packaged medicines, packaged devices. We've seen a globalization of the marketplace, um, automated management systems, and we'll talk very briefly about how that works, instant global communication. I can get on my phone, I can order something from China and uh, have it overnight shipped and, and, ha and have it on my doorstep by tomorrow. And uh, a lot of this, at least in the distribution system, depends on packaging for what's called just-in-time just inventory management. Okay, so without packaging, you wouldn't have the food processing industry that you've got, um, you wouldn't have the lifestyle that you have, and you wouldn't have the medical and pharmaceutical systems that we all depend on. Um, you couldn't get vaccines. Are you going to back a tanker truck of that up? And yeah, we'll take a 40 gallons of penicillin and, and some erythromycin, and no, it, it just wouldn't work out very well. Okay, so some of the things that the package is responsible for are marketing identity, I've talked about that, consumer information, product quality, safety, and integrity, the thing that all you guys think about. Is it going to make the food spoil? Is this going to be okay when I open it up? And process compatibility, which is something that nobody thinks about. But again, think about the mass production at end of this. Things have to be produced very quickly and very inexpensively. So if that doesn't work out very well, then you've got a problem. And this is one of the reasons that you can't get your packages to open sometimes, is they're so intent on producing it quickly that some of the features fall by the wayside. So some of the basic functions here are protection, utilization, and communication. Um, everybody thinks about protecting your food from contamination from the outside, either intentionally or unintentionally, and you, so you want to keep things uh, nice and fresh. But some of the things that people don't think about are control of access to the product. One of the great changes was, the, was bringing in regulations for everybody proof access to product, which is actually called child proof or child resistant packaging, and I'm told keeps everybody else out too, except little kids. You have to find a kid to show you how to do it. But the reality of that is that childhood poisonings dropped almost overnight. Emergency room visits fell off and it was just absolutely wonderful. So part of this is keeping the wrong people from getting at what you really want to do. And, and of course the extreme example of this is this odd little, odd little thing on the side here which is a nuclear fuel cask. And those are actually built not to be tampered with and also not to break open when, they, when they're thrown from a truck. And there's some wonderful footage out there which I can never find in use, useful form. But to test these, they actually parked them across the railroad track and fired a, a rocket propelled train at it to see what would happen. And they bounce rather nicely. So it works out. Um, utilization, uh, uh, proper availability of a product for its intended purposes. We've got about, what, 150 people here or so. Some of you are asthmatic. Statistically, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, and if nobody is, well, then we've beaten the odds. But, um, almost every asthmatic carries some kind of an inhaler for short-term events. That's, that's uh, just sort of a core uh, utility function that comes from packaging and it's very important. Some of the other things that happen are economic 
value being added. And one of the most astonishing ones is Pez candies. Who actually would eat Pez candies if they didn't come in a nifty little dispenser? I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're just south of aspirin in terms of taste as far as I'm concerned. So um, that's good, but you'll see spray paint and, all, and cleaners and all kinds of things. And finally, communication, which has become a big part of this. Because again, remember that we're dealing with large quantities of material moving in a lot of different places. It has to tie in with shipping systems and also marketing and economics. So we have to understand which product it is, um, how's it going to tie into the, to the sales campaign, and again, if you want to see how the, this would work, go to the cereal aisle. Look around and see all of the promotion that's being done up and down the cereal aisle, and usually it's tying into whatever the latest movie is, whatever the latest video game is, whatever the latest toy fad is, um, and this, this change, changes and churns all the time. Who's supposed to use it, when do you use it, and how? Okay. So, if you don't have the instructions, and we'll see who actually reads this, we're going to see some. Okay. Um, if you ever want to really, if you, if you don't think this is true, and you really want an interesting time, go to your cupboard, take all the labels off, and try to fix dinner. You're going to have a nifty tuna fish dog food toilet cleaner souffle going before you know it. You absolutely have to know what's in there and how to put it all together. Okay. And of course, there are things that we just absolutely can't help. Um, you know, when, once it's all put together, then, then things get really bad. Yeah, put it, in the, put it in the oven, set it to negative 325 degrees and let it bake for a while and then it'll all come apart. That's not going to happen. I usually use this in a thermodynamics lecture, but uh, couldn't, couldn't resist it. But again, so one of the important things, and, and one of the things that people never think about when they're trying to rip open their breakfast cereal in the morning is that communication is a big part of this. They think, may think about it when they're reading the box, but that's about it. So in, in, in times past, we had printed labels. In the 1970s and 1980s, this shifted to UPC code, which is a, a machine-readable code. And this had a couple of interesting consequences. First of all, it allowed fewer mistakes and faster checkouts and, of course, fewer people employed at stores. And this went a lot quicker. But it also allowed data systems to track what's going out of a store and, by extension, the bigger codes that are on the shipping cases to track what's coming in. And once you've done that, you've got an inventory management system that can be automated. And that's very interesting because then you can start shifting the economics of how all this stuff works. This has been pushing towards a much smaller, much more easily readable system called RFID, which you're probably familiar with. But the general, the, the sort of the, uh, the, the holy grail of this is to have a system where both inventorying and checkout is done automatically. You just drive your shopping cart through a scanner, wave your credit card at another reader, and off you go. Uh, if that, the cost of this has not come down to the point where this is widespread, though, at least not yet. Okay. So if we were, since I have a captive audience here, and most of you are still awake, and, and some of you are even sober, um, one of the ways that we look at this is, is as a materials life cycle, materials utilization life cycle. And so what we're looking at is the material, are the materials and operations that the package sees, not the food or the product. And very quickly, uh, and we're going to skip through this very quickly, uh, just again, just to keep people from gnawing the wrists open, but. Um, <laughs> Just to give you an idea of, of how the material cycle works and some of the things that we think about. So the raw materials, things like energy, sand, wood, uh, oil, actually natural gas feedstock for polymers, um, these are pro produced into raw materials and then are, are typically converted in a secondary operation with the exception of glass, because if you've ever been in a glass plant, you'll see that it's, it's an enormously capital intensive kind of a thing. Um, finished packages are produced there, and this is where, the, where most people think it all starts. You've got a food factory somewhere, and look, we've got cans, we've got bottles, we've got jars, and they're coming in from somewhere, and they're filled, and off you go. But there's a whole um, infrastructure behind that that most people don't see. Why does this matter? Because if you look at the world, thing, the things that are going on in the world, one of the things that happens is that you'll see competition for materials, and you'll also see some other concerns. I've seen uh, ructions around uh, sand being used for container glass, for instance. People don't want their pet beach dug up to make a bunch of jars, and this will happen occasionally. But bigger things, the price of oil, the price of natural gas fluctuates, and this affects how these materials are used. Also steel. One of the things that's happened is that the price of steel has escalated because of the world building boom. And one of the effects that you may see in your food packaging is that a lot of the things that you used to get in steel cans may start turning up in pouches because they use less material, they cook more easily, better product quality. Uh, it's something that we've worked on in industry for years. It uh, actually came out of the military MRE system. And uh, wonderful, but those filling, 
the filling speeds are fairly slow and the implementation is kind of difficult from, from a factory standpoint, but they're beginning to make the leap. The cost, cost motivation is just cropping up too, too big behind the uh, materials costs in this. So the product goes in. Uh, when we do this stuff, we see it as a system going out because there will be interactions between the package and the product and actually with the outside environment as well sometimes. goes into a, tra into a transportation system, typically uh, truck and rail for overground ship shipment, but uh, if it's overseas, then it will be by ocean-going vessel. see a few barge, container barges on the Mississippi, but not many and air shipment, which is kind of specialized, in a distribution and retail. And the reason that we do this as a big cycle is that by the time the consumer gets it, then they have to make a decision. What's going to happen to that packaging material when, that, when you're getting rid of it? One of the things that you can do is you can just pitch it. This is where a lot of you groundwater guys come in because, again, you're dealing with landfill issues all of a sudden. So, you know, if you're Kodak, remember Kodak? They were in business up until about last week. They used to print a lot of yellow on everything. They used cadmium yellow printing on their packaging, and all of a sudden you had the CONAG, the Coalition of Northeast Governors, saying, wait a minute, we're, getting a, we're concerned about the cadmium that's coming out of this waste getting into the groundwater, and so they had to reformulate all of their inks to, uh, to accommodate that. So you've got concern, concerns about things coming out of the waste stream. You can reuse, oops, you can reuse stuff, but again, you know, you're going to take a, your empty can of tomato back to the store and go, can I have another one? Fill it up. You know, here, I'll put, just put some foil over the top and we'll take that home. That would work for, well, that wouldn't work at all. And finally, of course, recycling and the reuse of materials. This is something that's been on the, uh, on the, uh, been on the increase for actually for a good long period of time. We'll see some statistics uh, around this as we go along. But one of the other things that happens, we've seen this materials use cycle, and that makes intuitive sense to a lot of people. But back to information, this is where some interesting things that most people don't understand about the retail chain. And so the information that's coming out, particularly with machine readable codes, is that a lot of this is driving the retail, is driving retail operations. And again, I'll, I'll whip through this very quickly. Um, if we look at how the material goods are being shipped out, manufacturer to uh, distributors in inventory to store inventory, which is very short, and then points of sale. Um, if we look at what's coming the other way, we get customer information out of the points of sale. So as you go into the store and you wave a couple of things at them, you wave a little loyalty card at them, and you wave your credit card at them, knowing you can't have the number, there's no money in it anyway. Um, what do you have? You've got a lot of information about your customer. That's pretty interesting because all of a sudden you've got information about who's standing there at the retail aisle. You've also got some information about what they're buying. And there, this has been played with for many years. And, and so uh, one of the things that's happening and has happened for a long time is targeted, targeted marketing. And there have been some enormously embarrassing cases of the wrong things being advertised to the wrong people at the wrong time. And I'll share stories with you off the microphone here because most of them are pretty lurid and occasional divorces and whatnot. But um, again, what you have is a lot of information about your customer. Okay, you also have a lot of information about what, your, what, invent what the inventory is doing. If you could do that, you can do the inventory orders, and it's just done largely automatically. Again, there's some human oversight as well, but a lot of this is, is, is done using software. Um, this goes back to distributor's inventory, and this is not what you think it is. Dist distribution inventory, particularly in the grocery business, is just what's in transit. There's almost nothing in, in you know, sort of dust-covered warehouses where people have secret meetings and you know, beat up prisoners and all the stuff you see on TV. That's pretty much gone. They're cross-docking operations. Everything's always moving. Uh, manufacturers inventory this, except for a seasonal product like string beans or something, um, you're not likely to see a lot of stockpiling material anyway because it costs money to keep stuff that isn't making money. And this goes back to manufacturing production. Now what's interesting is operations like Walmart have taken this a step further. There are actual accounting Phillips that have been done to turn this into kind of a depot operation. So if you buy a big screen television from Walmart, they didn't own it. Okay, and it, they, no, it didn't fall off a truck somewhere. This is in Illinois. Um, what ha what's happened is that they've contracted with Samsung or the LG or whoever the manufacturer is to hold that until it's sold. And when it's sold, then the pr purchase price is split between the 
retailer, they take their percentage, and then they, the uh, customer is paid. This is very different than other inventory systems where they're billed and then they pay after a certain period of time. And this is beginning to, ex again, accelerate this very low and lean inventory kind of a system. But back to our information cycle, we also get transportation information because this stuff is shipped. It's, it's sent from point A to point B to point C, and the trucks themselves are tra tracked, and any kind of shipping from one to the next is also labeled in. Once you've got that, then you can start looking at order lead times. And again, think of the automation that happens around this. So you sell out nine of the dozen items on your grocery store shelf. They know that it take, it's going to take two days to get the rest of them, and they and it, it's predicted that it will. Th this other three will sell out in two days. The order is tripped automatically, and just as the last item leaves the, leaves the store, the new shipment comes in and it's stocked. There's nothing in a back room at all. This is the ideal. Eh, they get closed most of the time. And so you get optimal order quantities as well. But from other databases, and again, once you know who your customer is and where they are and what they're buying, you can start doing some marketing demographics as well. So a lot of this tracks out of the machine-readable codes on packaging, both for consumer packaging and for distribution packaging. So the very tight inventory management can happen. And it's all a function of this information that's carried along almost as an afterthought. So what's happened then, except for these depot operations, which are very experimental, is that you're into just-in-time distribution that's very efficient. So if, if I order up $1,000 worth of goods, I get the bill and it's got a two net 30 discount on it, that means that if I sell it before, if, if I can sell it and pay that bill before that 30 days is up, I don't have to pay the full $1,000. I get a, say, a 2% 2, 2 discount, okay? So I can actually sell this stuff at my build cost and make the 2% and keep it. And this is the profit margin for really large-scale distribution outlets. And all of this depends on very tight inventory management. All of that, in turn, depends on the information that's carried in packaging. But it's taken a bit, been taken a, bit, a step further. All of a sudden, you've got your smartphones, which, you know, for a lot of people are, are you know, damn stupid phones because you can't, they got 93,000 buttons, and what do you do with it? Um, but what you can do, there are apps, and you can scan the, uh, you can scan what, what other people think about your buttons up here too. What people, what people, what other people might think about the product that you're looking at. You can look for in-store coupons. You can look for direct, direct ordering. You can look for other people's reviews of it, and more importantly, you can look for better deal. And this has thrown marketing completely on its head. Um, you've got people at stores, they're like, they're looking at a product, they're saying, okay, well, I can order this from somewhere else, I can order it from Amazon, it's not so much for food products, unless you're buying caseloads, um, and off you go. Walmart has an experimental store in Southern California that doesn't have any inventory at all. You basically order it uh, via QR, uh, QR codes, and um, it shows up, it will be delivered you know, in a, in a short period of time, they're trying for home delivery and some other demographic things that they think might actually work. Um, a lot of interesting stuff happens here. Anybody, is there a Best Buy store anywhere nearby? Okay, guess what? Best Buy has become a showroom for Amazon, and it's driving them crazy because what people do is they go to Best Buy, they shoot the, the barcode or the QR code attached to the product, they find a better deal on Amazon, they order it, it's delivered in two days. You know, they save hundreds of dollars. And they were very re reluctant to do anything about this, and so their first move was to change the QR codes in the store so that the standard apps wouldn't read it. Oh gosh, that makes sense. I couldn't type in the model number. Hello. So uh, they have a new CEO among other things, and the old ones were sort of been sidetracked even though he started the thing. So this can be a real problem. And take it, take it a step further, if we look at this in terms of the sort of the classic marketing funnel where you try to attract a customer, bring them in, make them choose amongst a small group of things, this has all been thrown on its ear. And one of the big things that this has caused this change is the ability of the customer to take a single item, to tap into a data network, and to find out what other people think about it, actually write what they think about it, find a better price, find a better deal, find a better delivery system, and it's completely tangled up the sort of traditional roots of retail. And again, it gets back to this information that's being carried along. So you thought you were going to hear, you hear me talk about paper bags and glass jars, and here I am talking about distribution informatics. Oh my god. Well, people are still awake at least, some of you. That's okay. But again, the change in this is that some, it wraps around things that you 
uh, see every day in your life. So let's get back to this. How can this back backfire? Well, back to our Cocoa Krispies, and this is a couple of years old now, but it's just a great story. Man, and because, mostly because it, it involves all those rotten people in San Francisco where I used to live. Um, <laughs> Well, it went fewer, right? So, anyway, um, what happened was, Coco Krispies advertised that they could boost your immunity and implied that you know you'd have all these wonderful health benefits. And I forget what the what the time lag here was. I think it was about six weeks. But the city of attorney of San Francisco said, "Wait a minute, this is ridiculous." Of course, the feds are asleep. Um, but he said, "You know, prove it. Let's see it." So what they had to do was pull pull this off the shelves, at least on the West Coast and finally nationally, and just plain cut it out. How did this happen so quickly? You had the confluence of connectivity of the, of the customer, of course, the email co connections and things that happen here, and their ability to look stuff up as they go in the store. They can look up what the nutritional content is. They can look up whether people think this is true or not. And in fact, they can sit there in the store and register a complaint as they go. And knowing San, San Francisco, of course, being just north of Silicon Valley, that's exactly what they did. And off you go. So what you have is this very fast response that can happen. It's very interesting. So more useful kinds of things. Um, one of the things that people always ask me about, and I just threw this in here, what about this use by date? What about the best, best buy, not best buy the retailer, but best if used by sell by dates? And the core rule in all of this is, you know, for USDA products, meat, poultry, dairy products and stuff. Typically there's a sell-by date and if you take, you know, you're taking your chances uh, after a reasonable period after that. For other kinds of things, processed kinds of foods, it's kind of up to you because in this inventory management system there's a huge premium on fast turnover. People don't want to see that something's got a date, a, a shelf life date that's three years in the future even if it's a stable product. Vinegar. Vinegar has a shelf life of like seven years. What does it turn into? It turns into vinegar. Come on. <laughs> But if you look, typically these things are tagged for about a year, and this is mostly to churn the, to keep the product turning over. And, and there's, it's worth the risk of, since the inventory levels are fairly fairly low, and since they know that people will, will reflexively throw things out if they see that the date's been exceeded. Oh my God, the vinegar's you know 368 days old. We've got to throw it out. It might turn into vinegar. Um, more sales. And so the best if used by data is, well, it takes a little bit of interpret interpretation here. Now I will say that I did grab a soda from the back of a fridge one time that was about three years past its date and really that was awful. It was, you know, it's, it, it, we we'll get into flavor chemistry here, but it had lost about half the flavor constituents. So it sounded, it tasted a lot like an aluminum refinery at that point and, and it was very bad. So the things that packages have to be, they have to be non-toxic. Poisoning your customers is bad for sales. It has to be sanitizing, sanitary. Infecting your customers is bad. It has to be strong. Having, having it burst is probably bad. If it's too strong, it's going to wind up being too expensive. It has to be a good barrier. And that gets to be problematic. When was the last time any of you actually cut up a head of lettuce for a salad? And there's going to be some smarty pants out there. Oh, it's, yeah, like, that's more natural. I always do that. But everybody else is lazy, just like I am. They rip a bag open and they dump it out. That's a good barrier, but it's not a perfect barrier because if you have a perfect barrier, that lettuce is alive. And it will sit there and it will act like a drowning goldfish. <laughs> and it will be, and there's nothing for it to breathe, so it dies and starts to ferment almost within the hour. You could try this. Put some in a mason jar and let it sit for a couple of days and then throw the whole thing out. You won't want it. Um, and so a good barrier may allow gas exchange. Meats are the same way. They have to be kept red or people will think that they've somehow gone off. And so there's a very a lot of oxygen coming through meat packaging. For fresh produce, it has to be a lot of oxygen availability. Um, for spaghetti sauce, yeah, it really should probably not breathe too much. Okay, it has to be easy to use, it has to be cheap, because it's always seen as a cost item. It has to integrate with the manufacturing system. Again, if you can't mass produce it, it's probably not going to do very well. And finally, it has to be recyclable. And a lot of regulation is wrapped around this. You have, actually have to have some recyclability in this. So real quickly, and I keep saying this, but you know, I put a lot of stuff in here. And, you, know, you know, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you know the rest of it. But um, Shelf life, everybody says, well, there's a shelf life of this. About There are really two shelf lives. One of them is, is the product usable? That is, is it going to start fermenting and crawling around on its own, or poisoning somebody, or is it going to taste awful? People are used to that. It's also unsaleable. One of my early projects in industry was working with squeeze bottles of ketchup. And the structures that we developed were wonderful, but the problem is that it let in just enough oxygen to turn the outside layer, just a couple of molecules thick, brown. So when you saw this, it looked spoiled. It wouldn't sell, you couldn't sell it, we never released it. And we had to control that 
surface browning because it looked terrible. It, it was an unsaleable product. It was perfectly safe. It just looked nasty. And so, um, again, if you get the perception that something is spoiled, or if it looks unsaleable, then you've got a problem. Primary packages, uh, if you've worked with food regulation, you'll know that this has to be a food, approved, food contact approved material. You can't just throw it in the, the scrap plutonium that you've got sitting around in the garage. Probably that's not going to work out very well. Um, and so what you have are food, FDA approved food contact materials for packaging. And at, with the increase in radiation processing, there's an extra bump in that in that that has to then be approved for that type of processing to make sure that you don't have things migrating out of it. Um, you know, other things you, you sort of sort of wonder about as you go, but it, you know, anything that actually touches the product then has to be approved for that. Secondary things wind up being unitizing and, and just sort of general containerizing of things, and these then fold out as, as can actually be used as point of purchase displays as well. In the industry, we think of primary materials, and this gets back to the to the material use cycle that we talked about, uh, glass, metal, steel and aluminum. Steel and aluminum actually shoot it out for the can market. In the UK, you can actually get thin wall steel soft drink cans, uh, just like the aluminum ones you get here, just because the British steel industry has a lot of support. Uh, paper and plastics and all kinds, but these are typically inexpensive polyolefins, polyethylene, polypropylene. Uh, PET, which is not simple, but um, is getting cheaper by the hour, used for a lot of the drink bottles and sodas. And secondary materials, everything from chemical coatings to, to tapes and inks and the propellant and aerosol, the gas that makes it work. Uh, microwave susceptors, the, the things that make your breakfast cook sometimes, uh, various coatings and theft prevention materials. And finally then people say, well, why doesn't any of it work? Okay, we've got 6,000, well actually more than 6,000 emergency room visits per year. And one of the things I was going to bring in here, and it just, just didn't make it into the suitcase, I have a data retail card, something on this scale, except it's about five times bigger. It's about this big, and it held a 64 megabyte, that's 64 million bytes of data, card from Walmart. This was their theft prevention strategy. They put it in a card that was so big you couldn't stick it in your pocket. And so they're, they're depleting the, the entire planet of oil to make these cards. And of course, then you can't get in them. Um, you know, it takes a cutting torch and, and, uh, or, or worse. And there is actually a secondary market of little can opener type devices to cut these things open. And most of this is wrapped around theft prevention. They, they, they don't want something where you can zip it open and get the product out. And what occur, never occurred to anybody is that these are pretty common. I mean, you, you can probably open one of those up in the store, or you can do what some very clever people in Walmart did. They were actually mailing product out of the store using the post office in the Walmart. They'd box it up and send, just send it out directly from inside the store and mail it to themselves. How hard could that be? It took them quite a while to catch on to it, too. One of the trends, which, which is, is, a, is a big combination of both processing and packaging, is aseptic boxes. You'll see an increase in these. And again, think about the materials used that goes into packaging. It used to be that you'd get your milk uh, in, in a glass bottle. Now we're, to, we're in cartons and looking for longer shelf life. It might have been a can at one point. Now we have composite structures that are plastic, foil, and paper. And the trick to this is that you're doing high-speed processing of the material before it ever goes into the in, into the into the container rather than filling a can, sealing it up, and then cooking it in a big steam retort, which is very energy intensive, very expensive, and very slow. Um, the problem with this is that to produce it, you need some very specialized equipment. The capital costs on this are quite high, and the operator training is uh, pretty extensive. I worked with some of the uh, with a machinery producer, and one of their biggest problems was that the um, operators of these things, something would go wrong inside, something would jam up, and if you, if you could see this better, this isn't a great picture, but if you could see this better, you'd see that there are glove box uh, uh, entry points in there to actually work on the machinery if something goes wrong. The early ones didn't have this, and what would happen is something would jam up inside them. The guy who had been working on machinery all his life would just open one of the hatches, go in there with a wrench, fix it. And the problem is that the whole machine is sterile, it, it has been sterilized. So what you have to do is shut it down or re-sterilize it, yell at the guy, make him promise not to do it again. But it's jammed and you've got to make production. And so one of the things that, that is absolutely necessary about this is that it's sealed, it's under a, a, a positive HEPA, I forget the HEPA level 7 I think, uh, positive sterile airflow to keep anything, any leakage going outward. But the, at the end of the day what you have is very low energy use, very good material use, and very long shelf life. Okay, so finally, um, recycling. Okay. All this stuff's happening. You've got information flowing back and forth. You've got goods go flowing back and forth. 
Um, you've got occasional PO'd customers who are cutting themselves trying to get those miserable cards open. And then it's all got to go somewhere. And as you guys well know, we've got groundwater people here. Anybody here working with landfills directly? Good, they can't call me a liar. Um, but what we're looking at here is the, the waste system isn't, isn't misunderstood. And then people are saying, oh God, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, he's gonna start talking about garbage dumps. Well, sort of, kind of. Okay, let's look at, let's look at how, how dirty we really are. Um, some of the interesting things that have happened here are municipal solid waste generation rates and through 2007, uh, current data goes to, I think, eight or nine. It lags several years from, from EPA. Um, but you'll notice a couple of things are happening. Obviously, we're making more junk, but we're making less junk per person. Let me get back to why that happens. Oh, well, we go. we're running out of landfill space. Okay, and so appropriate places for refuse are becoming scarcer year by year. And the question as to some other method of disposal must soon confront us. What century is this from? 1889. They were talking about the streets of New York, and they had to move, move thousands of tons of manure and a lot of dead animals out of the way. You think, you think that towing dead cars is bad, you know, imagine. And it really wasn't very pretty. So this has been a complaint. I'm sure you can find this chiseled on a wall in Pompeii or something. Uh, it's, it's always been, a, been an ongoing concern. The reality is very different. Um, but what's really begun to happen is that the number of operating landfills has dropped because you can't just dig a hole in the ground and throw, throw your old packages into it anymore. What you have to do is have a fairly highly engineered landfill structure that protects the groundwater. And again, I had a bunch of cross-sectional diagrams and things and hopefully threw most of them out just to keep you guys from falling asleep in your breakfast here. Um, but the point is that the expense has gone up and this drives what people are thinking about what they're doing. RCRA, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, established uh, some fairly stringent landfill requirements, and it turned the town dump into a highly engineered disposal facility. And this has become more regional because, of course, the uh, capital investment behind this is extraordinary. It takes millions of dollars to put one of these things together, and a lot of people don't want it, and uh, unless there's a lot of unemployment, in which case they do want it and they compete for it. But inside all of this, where does landfill waste go? It goes absolutely no nowhere. Uh, there's no water for anaerobic digestion. There's no air for aerobic digestion. It's basically a sarcophagus. There's a worker, uh, Bill Rathje, who was out of Arizona forever and I think has, has wandered off to UCLA at this point. But he's an archaeologist and what he did, uh, probably for lack of funding, was to start digging up local garbage dumps and expanded this out. And what he was finding was food that was, at the time that he did it, probably 40 to 50 years old. It's nothing you'd want to eat, obviously. It's microbial now. But you could tell what it was. You could read the newspapers. You could see what the food was if, if very dried out. Um, basically, everything's mummified. And so what happens is that when you landfill stuff, it just sits there. It's not really digested. So there are some facilities. Uh, Puente Hills in California has worked with recovering methane. So they found that if you put enough water in there, you can get anaerobic digestion, and it starts generating meth methane. They're running a small fleet of vehicles and, a power, and some power micro turbines off this on an experimental basis. And again, you're kind of reducing the volume. But this drives recycling. Think about it, it costs a lot of money to throw stuff out. You gotta find something else to do with it. You can't throw it over your neighbor's fence forever. Okay, so what's happening here? Um, tipping fees are, are a on average uh, about $50 a ton and stably increasing at about $1.25 a year. Massachusetts, very low on, on usable space for this kind of thing, 105 40 A lot of their stuff is exported. New Hampshire, at 72.97, Oregon at 25 is very low, and guess what? We've got Washington State down there at no number five. They have a lot of legacy landfills that add to their uh, uh, tipping fee cost. Guess what they do? They export to Oregon. Seriously. And uh, again, a map that I've left out: the five boroughs of New York ship it in all different directions. Everybody sends it someplace different because they've got no place left to put it. We can make jokes about Wall Street another time. Um, but what's happening then is you've got huge, huge exports and transport that's beginning to happen because the disposal costs are so high. This motivates both recycling and some interesting economics. The other thing that you can do is to start incinerating this and, and a previous speaker talking about the uh, proper doses of mercury and cadmium and coal. Wait till you see what comes out of garbage. Okay, and so this has been done on an experimental basis, but again, it's very popular uh, coal, mixed waste, uh, wet garbage plants um, are very popular in the northeast corridor simply because there's little space for other kinds of disposal. You may as well generate, generate power out of it. And some of the panics you see about 
decreasing landfill space seem to coincide with building booms and funding. There's, you know, I'm not saying there's a connection there, but um, occasionally this kind of happens. And one of the interesting things is, for instance, if you take a PET soda bottle take a, or, or a drink bottle, go outside and set fire to it. It goes like a, it goes like a torch. There's a huge energy content, content in this, and there's no easy way to really recycle it. So you can grind it up and remelt it, but sometimes if, you, if the economics of that don't add up, sometimes it makes sense to use it as fuel, and it works out pretty well. You can reuse things. Bottle bills, um, Canada does pretty well. Uh, United States does pretty well. We've got 11 states and eight Canadian provinces have a, have a mandatory uh, bottle deposit, except for none of it. This, this is the only joke I'm gonna really drop in your lap. You know, they did the vote and they were having none of it. Oh God. Come on, I wait all year for this. But here's the problem. Reusing takes an enormous amount of capital investment. I grew up in Michigan. I didn't grow up at all, but I got older in Michigan, and when it, they have a, a bottle bill, and as this was happening, it's wonderful, because Michigan is all coastline, and so you didn't have to bring a first aid kit when you went to the beach, which is a very real thing in, in, my, in my childhood, uh, just because there was so much broken glass everywhere. That went away, but what you had was uh, return facilities that were done at the stores, and so they had these storerooms full of icky old bottles that they had to deal with, and this has been automated to a large extent now, but it's, it's a huge capital investment. You've got a fleet of bottles that are making round trips. That's very expensive. So this gets fought uh, very hard and, and very dirtily um, in states where they try to bring it in. Co uh, I think the latest one was, was Colorado. So one of the things you'll see in, correlated pretty strongly, although not perfectly, is that st states with a lot of tourism, and particularly states with a lot of beachfront property, have bottle bills. So you'll see it in Oregon, you'll see it in Michigan, which again, in Hawaii, places like this where they're depending on a, sort of a litter-free environment, but put a little money behind it and it begins to work. So recycling has increased, and this has been a function of the economics of it as well as much as the uh, popular support, and it comes down to an equation that looks roughly like this. There's often some subsidy, at least in tax breaks, for the recycling operations. Um, you're reducing these dumping fees, which as you can see are increasing year over year, you're getting revenue from the recycled materials. Since I work at a university, we do two things there. We heat air and we move paper. We don't produce anything useful there. We don't make cars, we don't cook hot dogs. Uh, we turn out hungover students, but I guess you can sympathize this morning. Um, but there's a certain amount of revenue associated with this, and one of the things that happens, we have a large paper recycling operation, and there's actually a spot, spot market for this. So it'll be $100 a ton, or $200 a ton, or $50 a ton, or whatever it is that day, and this begins to pay for trucking it out and, and sending it off back to the paper mill. Back to Oregon, if you go to fly into Portland PDX and you drive out on five, one of the things you'll go by is an Owens Corning uh, container plant, and it's all recycled glass there. They've got huge piles of broken glass. That's shipped fr from Seattle, not quite, uh, not quite from San Francisco, but all the way up and down the coast, people are shipping their glass to be reused there, just simply because it's reducing the costs of disposing it. So you're getting rid of the cost of disposal. Uh, you're getting rid of the cost. You've got to take out the cost of disposal uh, for the stuff you can't use. The cost of processing, sorting, and hauling, and the transportation costs are the killer in this. So people who live in remote areas like Bloomington or Champaign or Banna, they'll say, "Well, why can't we recycle our, our, you know, our vinyl furniture or something?" And I'll, you know, which technically you could do. And I'll say it doesn't make any economic sense. You've got to truck it hundreds of miles for some place to actually deal with this. So they'll have things like paper. There's enough volume and enough money in it. Other kinds of things, the volume's too slow and there's no place to re reprocess it. So certain things work and certain things don't in certain markets. It's very tightly segregated. Throw this in here. Um, if anybody, actually you can look this up, but these are the most common things that you'll see. PET, of course, soda bottles. Uh, HDP, which is mostly uh, milk bottles, PVC and other stuff as, as we go along. Number seven is sort of like, I don't know what's in there. Just put a seven on there, they'll, they'll, they'll deal with it. Well, there's a problem. When you start recycling things, I don't know about you, but I've occasionally changed the oil in my own truck, and what do you do with that used oil? Well, you look for a container for it. And of course, I know they sell used oil containers, and that's fine, but look, I've got some two liter soda bottles and a funnel. Okay, so that begins to pile up in the garage, and as it sits there, that oil is dissolving into the polyester, the terthalate structure of the container. Well, that's great. I mean, what's, you know, a little, yeah, Coca-Cola case tastes kind of oily anyway, who cares? What if, it, you know, if you're, if you're working with, with uh, pesticides, if you're working with other kinds of things, and this gets back into the recycling stream, what's going to happen? 
So far, so good. Um, some of the people I know at the FDA labs in Chicago, we've looked into this, and what typically as pack, plastic packages are recycled, they're ground up very finely, they go, and they're essentially diluted out in, in a clean stream post-washing. And so the, the level is detectable in the parts per trillion level, uh, not even into the parts, parts in mid, middle parts per billion level, but nothing much more than that. But there, it's an ongoing concern. And this is one of the things that's restrained a lot of uh, returnable plastics because, again, if this isn't ground up, if it's not diluted, how are you going to ensure that somebody, you know, some mallet head like me hasn't kept his bug spray in there for three years and then brought it back? Glass washes cleanly, plastics not so much. One of, the, one of the more interesting studies coming out of Italy is that they found the core chemicals in copy toners, which has a name about as long as this room and we won't get into it, but they're finding it in dry pasta products that's, that are packaged in uh, cartons that have recycled paper content. You take all that paper that's produced at some university nobody's heard of and grind it up and turn it into boxes, for something useful for once, and turn it into a carton for your food. Is that copy toner, that black stuff, this stuff that you're looking at as you're falling asleep on your table, um, is that actually getting into the food? And the answer is yes, and nobody's too sure where that's going. Let's see about that. The, the best thing to do in terms of dealing with all of this is source reduction. This is something that we're seeing with all of our products. Uh, if you had bought a portable computer, and, not, and I didn't buy one, but I've hefted a few from the 1980s, they w weighed 40-something pounds. They had CRT screens in them, full-on keyboards. Now you can get better functionality out of one of these annoying little things that I'm not even going to pull out, but it's got too many buttons on it. You can do about the same kind of work on it. You're making things smaller, you're making them more efficient. Glass containers, which are very expensive to make, very heavy to transport, have gotten thinner and thinner year over year. Uh, steel containers, which unfortunately have to support a vacuum for most kinds of foods, they're vacuum packed, so they have to have a certain amount of strength, um, have gotten thinner to the extent that you can do this. And soda cans are so thin that they're basically aluminum balloons, and if you drop one, you'll find out they'll actually burst a lot of the time. So one of the things to do is to reduce the amount of materials that are actually traveling through the cycle. And this is where you get this. This is what's begun to happen. And this is so for municipal solid waste. One of the things that we're seeing here, other than a, that's actually working, is a leveling off of per capita waste generation. And the part of that is recycling. Part of that is that the stuff that we're throwing out is just made with less material in it. Cars have less. Car, cars are lighter, and everything down the line is as well. So for public health people, um, one of the things they worry about, you know, if our food's coming in plastic and the food's in us, what's in the food? And there have always been controversies about this. Uh, and this is one of the best of these, and I've got a 300-page PDF on the sort of synopsis of what finally happened with all this, which I'll send to you, but I will not read uh, in, in its entirety without a search engine anyway. But a DEHP, diethylphthalate, uh, used as a plasticizer, making the plastic soft in, in plastic blood bags. When they started using plastic blood bags. They noticed that blood lived longer. Guess what? Plastic permeates a bit of oxygen. The blood's pretty happy when it's breathing, and so it would actually last longer in terms of storage. And so, but they were also noting that these DEHPs, which are just dissolved into the plastic structure rather than being bonded in with the core chain structure, were beginning to migrate out. And you're starting to see, you were seeing 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter. This turned up in the patients, and, and problems expanded outward from that. Um, everything since has happened as well. One of the, and so one of the most more current ones, we, you'll hear this with styrene once in a while, don't drink hot tea from a styrofoam cup. Um, personally, I think the hazards to humanity for people not having their caffeine in the morning are a lot larger, but um, you know, we'll leave that with you. But the, one of the current ones is bisphenol A, and this is with the, uh, because it's used in so many products, can linings, uh, plastic bags, pretty much everything, um, there's a lot of concern about this, and one of the problems is that it's not an, an overt poison. It's an, it's an endocrine disruptor, disruptor, and it was originally detected in the effluent from paper mills, one of the chemicals they were looking at, looking at when they were looking at PCBs. And what they found was in, in an animal model, as animals matured, they failed to differentiate. Now this led to a lot of Marilyn Manson purchases and, and tattooing, and they were really worried about this. Um, but it's something that won't go away because it keeps turning up in, in a lot of other models. And, and I, I make a lot of fun of this, but the core of some of these studies has been that people have noticed in their lab animals um, some pretty serious changes that happened as they were eating or drinking out of plastic dishes or, or bottles. 
they said, wait a minute, there's something in their environment that we haven't seen before. And so they started analyzing the actual environment that these lab rats, I mean, they live in a steel cage with a little plastic water bottle. Well, it was a plastic water bottle. And um, it's, it's been a big fight ever since. So this has actually been banned uh, in a lot of countries, not in the United States. And this is, of course, is easily legible. You guys can read the nine decimal place accuracy of this. But basically, what we're looking at is a strong correlation with uh, bisphenol A concentration with various medical disorders. Of course, then the medical community has jumped on this. So we're seeing bisphenol A causes obesity, causes video game fascination, causes you know everything that you know. They read dime novels because of it. Um, the sorts of usual panics, but there's a strong correlation, though no serious causal link has been found with this, but it winds up being a, a real item of concern. And more interestingly, and I may leave this up here for just a little bit, um, this has turned into a big stink in, over the last few years about who was funding the study versus what they found. And this gets to be interesting. So for government-funded studies, we found uh, 94 found harm, 10 didn't. For chemical corporation-founded studies, guess what? No harm was found at all. And uh, 11 found no harm. So when, as the, reg the regulatory structure of this begins to evolve, the big fight has been between who's actually sponsoring the studies. And this isn't unusual in the, in the research community at all. So at the very end, everybody's going, thank God he'll shut up now. Um, Packaging really is, it's an integral part of everything you do. I mean, again, if you're an asthmatic, you depend on that, that inhaler, and that inhaler is a bunch of powder, but a lot of package. Um, if you, everything we've, we're eating and drinking here today is packaged at some point and, and handled. It's, it's absolutely necessary for global trade and distribution. Um, what they're really trying to do, rather than just make you mad, is to minimize loss, trying to maximize the consumer impact, which is a nice term for sell you more stuff, and trying to increase this market presence. And again, this information thing is, is sort of the latest thing. It's very interesting. And we need to do, we, we have to have it to bring the best products to market. That's just kind of the end of it.